Hey, Family Church, it is hurricane season, and you know what that means. All of us are watching the tropics and wondering if we are in the cone. As a storm approaches, we all start making our preparations and hoping and praying that the power doesn't go out. Because when the power goes out, the AC goes out, and we still live in South Florida, so no AC is no bueno. But fortunately for us, we have Florida Power and Light. I know a lot of people who work for FPL, many of them go to Family Church, and I know that they spend a lot of time planning and preparing for storm recovery. FPL makes it their highest priority to restore our power as quickly and safely as possible. When you see those FPL trucks roll into the neighborhood after a storm, everybody cheers because they've got the power and they're bringing it back to our house. We can all relate to how badly we need electric power, but what about spiritual power? As we continue our series on the Gospel of Luke, we're looking at Jesus' ministry here on earth, and we're going to see that Jesus brought the power. He brought the juice. Jesus uses God's power to prove that he is who he says he is. And over the next several weeks, we're asking the question, is Jesus able? And the answer is yes, Jesus is able. And St. Luke shows us how Jesus is able to meet power with power. Sure, there are spiritual forces of evil at work in this world, but Jesus is greater. Jesus is the only one who can meet all of our physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual needs. I also want to let you know that we're going to take on another spiritual discipline as a church family. Many of you participated in seven days of prayer, but not asking all of us to participate as we start to memorize scripture together as a church family. And our first verse is Luke chapter 11, verse 9, where Jesus says, And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Jesus wants us to come to him, and he wants us to keep coming to him because he is able. Jesus has the power that we need to face all of life's storms, and he's bringing it to us as we call on him. So get your Bibles out. Turn your Bibles on because your neighborhood pastor is coming right now to open the Word of God and show you how St. Luke gathered the evidence for us, and he proves that Jesus is able. All right. Hey, what's up, Family Church? I'm Jimmy Scroggins. I'm one of the pastors here, and we're about to have our Bible study, as that guy just said. He said, why are you showing a video of yourself to introduce yourself? And the reason is, we are meeting in 15 locations across 27 different services, four different languages across three counties, and we show that video at the beginning of every teaching series, so we showed it down here as well. But go ahead and do what we said. Get your Bibles out. Turn your Bible on on your devices. Grab a Bible from the pew in front of you, and open it up to Luke chapter 7, the Gospel of Luke chapter 7, And we're continuing this series from the Gospel of Luke. At Family Church, we're studying the Gospel of Luke for the next several months, all the way really into 2024. And today we're going to look at Luke chapter 7, and we're going to ask this question, is Jesus able? Now, I know some of you guys are super religious. Uh, You're SEAL Team Special Forces Christians. You guys have been going to church your entire lives. You know everything about the Bible. So if I say, is Jesus able? You're like, of course Jesus is able. But I also know that in this room, uh, there are some of you who just aren't very religious at all. Some of you uh, came today, maybe you came because you go to PBA. And if you go to PBA, we are super glad that you are here. I'm personally glad that you're here. I'm a trustee at Palm Beach Atlantic University. Um, I I have a son that graduated from PBA. I have a daughter-in-law that graduated from PBA. And I have a daughter who is a freshman at PBA. So I have a lot of my life invested in Palm Beach Atlantic University. So we're really glad that you are here. But some of you came and you came you came from PBA today because we've given you a free meal and chapel credit. I mean, that's the bottom line, right? And so I know you love Jesus and everything. Some of you, some of you don't. Some of you are like, hey, I'm really not even that religious. Some of you just had a really weird experience because you've never been to a church exactly like this. And this is different for you. And that's okay. Because the real thing that you need to figure out in your life is, is God really able to do what he says he can do? Can God really help you? Because every single one of us, regardless of our age or life stage, every single one of us has things in our lives that we cannot fix on our own. There are things that are happening to us that aren't our fault. There are consequences of choices we've made. And now we have a problem. Maybe it's a medical problem, a a relationship problem, a family problem. We have an issue, 
and we cannot fix it for ourselves. And the reason you know you can't fix it for yourself is if you were gonna fix it for yourself, you would have already done that. But now, you need somebody greater than you to do something for you that you cannot do for yourself. And you need to answer this question, is God able to do it or am I wasting my time in here? Is God able to help me or am I wasting my time in here? There's all kinds of things that make you feel that way. When you have a medical issue and you need healing, that can make you feel like you're trying to pray and maybe you don't know how to ask God, but God's not doing it. Maybe some of you uh, in our church family, you wanna have a baby and you've been trying and you've done everything that you know to do, but it's just not happening. And infertility can be very discouraging and you just, you just don't even know how to ask God anymore. Some of you have broken relationships that you want to be repaired. You want that relationship to be healed, but it's such a struggle and it's so hard and you just don't know if you're gonna make it unless God does something really special. Some of you deal with addiction and mental health issues and anxiety and depression and you want something to happen, but if you were gonna fix it yourself, you'd have done it a long time ago and you need God to do something, but you've asked him so many times and it just seems like it's, it's not happening. Is it even okay to keep asking God? Can God do what we need him to do? Will he do it? Is he inclined to do it? And I wanna tell you a story today from the Bible about when Jesus healed a guy. Jesus healed this guy miraculously and this is a guy that Jesus didn't know it's a guy that Jesus never actually saw, not even in the story. He never sees him. He doesn't know him. He doesn't talk to him. But Jesus miraculously intervenes and heals this person. And hopefully this will encourage you. So let's read from the Gospel of Luke chapter 7, the first 10 verses, and then we'll talk about what we can learn. Here's what the Word of God says. After he... Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people. He entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, he is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word, and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. And turning to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well, okay, this is a really remarkable story. Let me tell you why. Right before this story, Jesus preached a famous sermon. It's called the Sermon on the Plain. I know some of you thought I was gonna say Mount, but this is the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel of Matthew. The Sermon on the Plain is in the Gospel of Luke. He preaches this famous sermon, the Sermon on the Plain, but in this sermon, he says some really tough things. That's the sermon where Jesus says, uh, someone strikes you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. That's where Jesus says uh, you should love your enemies. That's where Jesus says if someone curses you, you bless them. Those are things that are very, very difficult for us to do, but Jesus challenged his disciples to do it. So when the crowd hears Jesus say love your enemies, for a first century Jewish person living in Palestine, the most natural enemy in the world is a Roman soldier. The Roman soldiers were occupying Palestine. The Roman soldiers were abusing the women and the children in Palestine. The Roman soldiers were taking advantage of their power by taking bribes and overtaxing people. So they were financially enriching themselves on the backs of the Jewish people. So the Jewish people hated the Roman soldiers. They hated their guts. 
And there were Roman soldiers stationed in every town, in every village, in every city. This Roman soldier happened to be stationed in Capernaum, this little village on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee, on the northern end of Israel. And this is where this Roman soldier lives and where he operates. But apparently, this particular Roman soldier was kinder and gentler than most others. This particular Roman officer, a, a junior level military grade officer, this particular officer uh, cared for the people. He actually wanted to encourage them in their religion, and so he gave the money to build the local synagogue. So he was probably a good and kind man. And this centurion also understood the principle of authority. Okay, is there anybody here, either you or your parents served in the military? Anybody like that? Raise your hands high. You or your parents served in the military. If you've ever served, some of you guys joined the military because you got sick and tired of your parents telling you what to do, so you joined the Marines or whatever, and they really helped you with that. So, so the way that it works, the Roman, the Roman military was organized a certain way uh, it's from top to bottom. The Roman legion was the largest unit of force and had about 4,800 men in a legion. A legion was made up of 10 cohorts with 480 men apiece in a cohort, a century had 80 men, and so, so six centuries made a cohort, and then a tent group had eight men. So a century was, was made up of 10 tent groups. So the centurion was over about 80 men. He was a junior level officer, but an officer nonetheless, responsible for 80 men, but he also had officers over him that he reported up to. That's why he says, I'm a man under authority, but I'm a man in authority. But when the centurion sends these different servants and representatives to go meet with Jesus, what the centurion didn't understand was that in the kingdom of God, when someone belongs to God, when you are in the family of God, you have an org chart that doesn't look like the Roman military. The org chart looks like this. Father, child, that's it. That's the organizational chart. If you are a child of God, you don't have to send intermediaries back and forth to God to talk to God for you. You can talk to God all by yourself and you can ask God about anything that's going on in your life. The Bible says this in many different ways. For instance, the Bible says there is no mediator between God and man except the man, Christ Jesus. The Bible says that God, that Jesus no longer calls us servants. He calls us friends. The Bible says that if we're children of God, if we've received Jesus by faith, we can boldly approach the throne of grace. The Bible says that we as Christians have the Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity living in us. The Bible says that when you receive Jesus, the Spirit of Jesus comes to live in your heart. And that means that you have, if you're a child of God, direct access to God for yourself. You don't need a better Christian to ask God. You don't need a priest to ask God. You don't need a pastor to ask God. You can talk to God yourself if you are a child of God. And if you're gonna take some notes, what can we learn from this text? What can we learn about healing and asking God and God helping us? So there's one thing, one, I would like you to say this. Jesus loves every person from every place. Jesus loves every person from every place. When you read the Bible, you read about a multiplicity of cultures. You read about people from a multiplicity of backgrounds. And this is a multicultural story. You've got the Jewish leaders. So you've got class. They're kind of upper class in the Jewish system, but they're ethnic Jews. You've got a Gentile servant who, who works for this centurion. You've got a Roman soldier, probably from Syria, maybe from Italy, we don't know. A Roman soldier. You've got these crowds. So Jesus is making his appeal and connecting with a variety of people from a multiplicity of backgrounds. And when you read the Gospels, you see that's what Jesus does. He's always inviting people in who feel left out. That's why you read the Gospels. There, there are lame people who are left behind by Jewish society, and Jesus pulls them in. There are blind people who are left out because they cannot see, and Jesus pulls them in. There are people who are Gentiles. They would not be accepted in Jewish society, and Jesus pulls them in. There are tax collectors who've been rejected by Jewish society, and Jesus pulls them in. That's what he does. There are demon-possessed people who are considered crazy by Jewish society, but Jesus pulls them in. He pulls in this Roman soldier, a Gentile, and that validates what he just said a few days before when he said, love your enemies. And somehow this Roman soldier believed that Jesus would love him. Do you? 
This Roman soldier believed that Jesus would love him. Do you? Because the Roman soldier goes to him and says, I, 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 the Roman soldier probably heard him preach sermons. Maybe the Roman soldier had been there when Jesus healed the lame or the paralytic. Maybe the Roman soldier had heard Jesus teach and just had been in the environment where Jesus was and he knew, I've got a problem. I'm going to go to the one who cares about all kinds of people and let them fix it. And I want you to know that Jesus loves you too. And there are people in this room right now from different backgrounds. Uh, we are different ages. We come from different places. Some of us were born in different countries. Our skin has different amounts of melanin in it. And I want you to know that Jesus loves every single one of us from every neighborhood and every place, every language and every race, rich or poor, gay or straight, male or female, young or old. Jesus loves all of us. And if anyone will come to Jesus, repent of their sins and believe in him, all of us can be forgiven for our sins and changed. Jesus is for every person, and so is Family Church. This is a church that is here for every person. There should not be one person in this city. There should not be one person who would come to this church and feel like they're going to be pushed down and pushed out because what we do at Family Church is what Jesus does. We want to pull people in and lift people up. It's so important. Did you see those baptisms we just watched on the screens? Different people, different neighborhoods, different places. And there, so when I, was, when I was a kid, we learned this song, and it's politically incorrect now, and I don't think we're allowed to sing it anymore. But the song, it said this, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. He said, we don't sing that anymore because we don't like to assign colors to everybody because you know, that's not really the color that anybody is. I know, I mean, this is white. Well, I kind of am. I'm kind of close, I know. <laughs> Never mind. Anyways, we want you to know, and Jesus wants you to know, and Jesus wanted the Roman soldier to know that Jesus is for everybody. He's for every person, from every place, every language, and every race. Number two on your notes, we see from this story that Jesus has authority over all things. Jesus has authority over all things. This centurion, this Roman soldier, was a man of authority who was under authority. He understood earthly authority, and the earthly authority told him something about heavenly authority. Now, when you say the word authority in today's society, some people already get triggered and you haven't even said anything. You just said authority, and people are upset because some people abuse authority. I mean, some moms and dads abuse authority. Some school officials abuse authority. Some pastors abuse authority. Teachers abuse authority. Some police officers abuse authority. Some, some bosses at work abuse authority. Authority can be abused, no doubt. But just because some renegades and sinners abuse authority doesn't mean that the principle of authority isn't important because the principle of authority is part of how God has, has built the structure of the universe. And if you spend your life resisting authority, you're spending your life resisting God because God has woven the principle of authority into the structure of the universe. You say, well, what do I mean? Well, if you read the Bible, you find out there's these different spheres of authority. Of course, God has authority over all things, but then God set up authority structures in the family or in the home. And so there is authority there. And if you are a husband and you are a father, let me tell you, the Bible says that God has made you the head of your home. It doesn't mean you're better than the other people in your home. It doesn't mean the other people in your home are there to serve you like you're the king and they're the servants. It means you have a special position. Of, dads, you have a special position of responsibility and authority in your homes. And all you PBA guys, you want to get married one day. You want to have kids one day. If you do that, you are accepting a special position of authority and responsibility in your home that you should not take lightly. You say, yeah, I can't be responsible for everything that goes on in my home. You're right, because there are things that are going to go on in your home with your spouse, with your kids, and it's not going to be your fault, and there's really nothing you can do about it. But if you are a husband and a father, it's not all your fault. It is all your responsibility. You are responsible to address it. You are responsible to fix it. That's what husbands and dads are supposed to do. Now, if you're married, you don't have to do it alone. You have a partner to help you. You have a partner who's smart. You have a partner who's wise. You have a partner who works hard. You have a partner who loves Jesus. And your partner and you together can dominate your environment. That's how it works. But there is authority within the family. Then there's authority within the church. You say, well, of course you would say that 
you're the pastor of the church. I know. But there is authority within the church. Now, the way that our church works, you say, well, Jimmy, how did you get to be the pastor if you have this authority? I got to be the pastor at this church because this church invited me to come be their pastor, and then they elected me, they voted on me to make me their pastor 15 years ago. That's what the church is. There are mechanisms that the church can use. If they decide to get a different pastor, there's a way they can get rid of this pastor and get a different one, and I'm not gonna tell you what that is, so let's not keep talking about that. Anyway, <laughs> there's authority within the church. There really, really is. Then there's authority, the government has authority. The Bible says that God has ordained government as a sphere of authority. There is authority within the workplace. There are people who are above you on the organizational chart where you work. There are people who are beneath you on the organizational chart where you work. It doesn't make you better than the other people. It just means there's a structure of authority. That's how God intends for all of us to work. And this Roman soldier fully understood this. Now, how much authority does Jesus really have then? Well, Jesus said this about himself in Matthew chapter 28. Jesus said, all authority in heaven, the places you can't see, and earth, the places you can see. All authority has been given to me, Jesus says. He owns it all. The Bible says that the earth is the Lord's, every square inch. The Bible says all the silver and all of the gold belong to God. The Bible says that God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He has all authority. And one day, everyone's going to recognize it. Okay, now you know that right now, not everyone recognizes God's authority, but one day they will. In Philippians chapter 2, the Bible says that one day at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Everybody's going to see it one day. And in fact, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 7 that one day in heaven, people from every tribe and tongue and nation are going to be worshiping Jesus together in heaven. Why? Because he has all authority. If there's one thing you should believe, you should believe that Jesus has all authority. And if he has all authority, that means you should submit to his authority. You should come under his authority. You should surrender to his authority. You should find out what his designs are for your life. And you should align your life with God's design because he has all authority. This Roman centurion understood that. Number three, because he has all authority, that means that Jesus, number three, has the authority to heal Jesus has the authority to heal. This centurion knew that he had some authority, but when it came to healing his servant, his number two guy, his XO, his executive officer, when it came to healing this guy, his authority didn't go that far. He couldn't, he could command people to come and go. He couldn't command disease to come and go. And something was wrong with his servant that he couldn't fix. And so Jesus has all authority, the centurion recognizes that. So in the centurion's mind, this whole conversation is very simple. He goes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, I know that if you command this disease to leave, this disease will go. I know that you can heal my friend and I'm asking you to do it. And it's very simple. If you want him to be healed, he'll be healed. If you don't, he won't. That's all I need to know. I don't need you to come over and say abracadabra. I don't need you to come over and hold my hand. I don't need you to come over and sing a song with me. I just need to know, will you heal my friend? Yes or no, because if you want to do it, you can heal him. You have the authority to heal. That's the essence of faith in Jesus. Believing that Jesus has the authority to do for you what you cannot do for yourself. He's the one who can say the word and make it happen. Do you believe that? I mean, that's really a big question. I mean, some of you came in, you, you meant to sit downstairs and you ended up in the balcony and some of you came in and you like to sit back there, but it's packed today because PBA day and you ended up on the front row, you ended up wherever, wherever you ended up. You gotta believe this. Do you believe that Jesus has the authority to bring the healing that you need? That's the faith that God is challenging you to have, because whatever it is, you have cancer, hey, if your parents are struggling and you want their relationship to be healed, if your marriage is struggling and you need healing in that relationship, if your mental health situation, your anxiety is a struggle and you need healing, you should ask God, he has the authority to heal, he does. 
There's the authority to do it. If he wants to do it, if he says it'll be done, it'll be, it'll be done. Now, I'd like to tell you that every time I pray for God to do something, he does it. Well, that's not true. I pray for God to do things. Sometimes he does exactly what I'm asking. Sometimes he doesn't. So I can't guarantee you what God's going to do, but I can tell you this. If I ask God to do something and he doesn't do it the way I want or on the timing that I want, it's not because he doesn't have the power or the authority. It's because he has sovereignly chosen to do what he wants to do. But he has the power and authority, and I don't mind asking him, and you shouldn't either. The principle of authority means this. Tell me tell it like this. If you, if you want me to come pray for you and you say, Pastor Jimmy, please pray for us because our marriage, please pray for us. We're trying to have a baby. We haven't been able to do it. Please pray for me. I've got cancer. Please pray for my parents. Please pray for my kids. They've wandered away from God. I want them to come back. Please pray for me. I've got a mental health issue. Please pray for my wife, my daughter, my son. They're struggling with anxiety. If you ask me to pray for you, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna ask you this question right here. What do you actually want God to do for you? And then you tell me what it is that you want, and I'm going to ask God to do that. I hate it when I need God to do something and ask somebody to pray for me, and they spend most of the prayer kind of explaining why they don't really expect anything to happen. So it goes like this. I've got cancer. Will you pray for me? Sure, I will. God, this guy's got cancer. I know you're probably not going to do anything about it, but the doctors are trying, and he's got chemo, and well, if he dies, help him to go to heaven, you know, peacefully. That is not what I'm asking. I'm asking for a healing. I want the cancer to go away. I want the depression to go away. I want my marriage to come back together. I want my son to come home. I don't need you to pray a prayer explaining to God why he's probably not going to do what we're asking him to do. Is he our father or not? Does he have the authority or not? We go to God, we ask him to do it. Ask him to do it. Don't be afraid to ask him to do it. You say, you just said he doesn't always do it. I know he doesn't always do it, but it shouldn't be because we're not asking. His authority, the centurion said, if you want it done, it'll happen. Just like I send a man out, tell him to come back. They do it. If you tell that to this disease, it'll be done. You know what the Bible says in James chapter five? The Bible says if you want healing, you should come to the elders of your church and ask them to pray over you and they should lay hands on you and pray a prayer of faith over you and anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord. That's what the Bible says you do when you need healing and if you need healing, that's what you should do. And I've got this oil right here. I anointed some people with oil this morning. They asked me to pray for them. They told me what they needed. I prayed for them. I don't know what God's going to do, but I know he has the authority to do it. He said, well, why do you anoint him with oil? I anoint him with oil because, well, the truth is I have no idea what the oil symbolizes at all. When I read the Bible, I don't know what it means. I don't know what it's for. But the Bible says when they come to you and you're a pastor of a church, you anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord and then ask God to heal them and pray in faith. That's what we're going to do around here. Next Sunday morning, Right down here at the conclusion of our service, we're going to have a, a prayer for healing, a special prayer for healing. And if you want to come, you want to bring somebody with you, there's something that you need. It could be emotional healing. It could be relationship healing. It could be physical healing. I don't know what you need, financial healing. Sunday you come, and you're going to come down front, and we're going to pray prayers of faith over you because we believe that God has the authority to heal. He does. At the same time, I'm not going to be presumptuous because I do not have the authority to heal. He has the authority to heal. So I can't declare things over you on my own initiative because I don't have the authority to send cancer away. Jesus has the authority to send cancer away. And so we've got to be humble and recognize sometimes he doesn't heal when I want the way that I want, but he has the authority to heal. Last thing, number four on your notes. Jesus responds to humility and faith. Jesus responds to humility and faith. So here's the question I'm asking when I'm reading this story. Why does Jesus do what the centurion is asking him to do? What was it about the centurion that made Jesus do it? 
I think it's found, you remember when the guy sends the Jewish leaders to him and the Jewish leaders start trying to persuade Jesus to heal the servant and the Jewish leaders are like, hey, Jesus, he's worthy, they say. He is worthy because he built the synagogue, we named it after him and everything. He's worthy because, look, he's a good guy. You should do it because he's worthy because of all the good things that the guy's done. But then later on, the centurion sends people to him and the centurion says, tell Jesus, I am not worthy. Did you see that in the story? The Jewish leader said he is worthy. The centurion says, no, I'm not worthy. In my own strength and in my own life, I'm just a sinner. I'm not worthy for God to do anything for me, and neither are you. Because the Bible says all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I'm not worthy. You're not worthy. Well, then why did Jesus do it? Jesus healed the servant, not because the centurion was worthy. He healed the servant because the centurion believed. He healed him because he believed. He said, I haven't found faith like this anywhere else. And he healed him. Some of you guys like to work remote. Jesus is healing remote. He doesn't even go to the guy's house. He doesn't even lay hands on the guy. He doesn't even see the guy. He doesn't even talk to the guy. He doesn't sing a song with the guy. He just says, okay, you want me to heal him? You believe I can do it? Okay, he's healed. And Jesus goes the other way. The guy gets healed remote. Why? Because the centurion said, I'm not worthy, but I do believe. I'm not worthy. You're not worthy. But who's worthy? Jesus is worthy. Jesus is worthy. He's the one who took our sins on himself on the cross. He's the one who's crucified for the sins of the world. He's the one who's buried in the grave. He's the one who's been raised from the dead. He is worthy. Jesus is worthy of our worship. Jesus is worthy of our prayers. Jesus is worthy for us to devote our lives to him. Jesus is worthy to take authority over disease and divorce and all kinds of disaster. Jesus is worthy of taking control and authority over diseases big and small. He's worthy to take authority over infertility and give us children. He's worthy to take authority over your broke bank account and your broken relationships. He's worthy to take authority over your broken heart. He's worthy to take authority over your broken habits. Jesus is worthy because he was crucified and raised from the dead. He is worthy and you should come under his authority and you should pray to him and you should expect him and you should ask him to do for you exactly what you need. Why? Because he has authority to do it. He's worthy to do it. He's got power to do it. Where else do you have to go? If you were going to fix those problems yourself with some self-help technique or some other thing, you would have already done it a long time ago. You should come to Jesus because he's worthy and he has authority. And to remind us of this, every Sunday at Family Church, we take the Lord's Supper, which we're going to do right now, we're going to eat the bread, which reminds us of the broken body of Jesus. We're going to drink the cup, which reminds us of the shed blood of Jesus. And I do want to remind you what the Lord's Supper is for. The Lord's Supper is for believers in Christ. If you're here today, you're not a believer in Christ, you're not a Christian, I don't recommend that you take the Lord's Supper. Why don't you wait until after you become a Christian for yourself, and then you can take the Lord's Supper with integrity. Family Church, we believe it's best for you to take the Lord's Supper after you've been baptized and after you've become a part of a neighborhood church. And I know we got all these PBA students and other people visiting from the community and people from out of town. Look, if you're a believer in Jesus and you would take the Lord's Supper at your church, then take it with us today as part of the extended family of Jesus that goes all around the world. But as we get ready to sing, we're going to pray, we're going to reflect, we're going to confess our sins, we're going to reconnect with God, we're going to to reconfirm in our own hearts and minds that he's worthy. And then in just a moment, we'll eat and drink all together. So right now, let's reflect, let's pray, let's sing before we take the Lord's Supper. What gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? There is no more 
for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this high hope, my hope is only Jesus. For Strange and divine, I can sing all is mighty, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Mm -hmm. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure. The price he has been paid For Jesus bled And suffered for my pardon And he was raised To overthrow the grave To this I hope My sin has been defeated Jesus now Chains are released. I can see I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Thank you for worshiping with us at Family Church at Home. Right now, all in person neighborhood churches are about to take the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a family meal for those who are baptized believers. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ and would like to take the Lord's Supper, please check out a neighborhood church near you and plan your visit in person for next Sunday. If this is your very first time at Family Church at Home, scan the QR code and fill out our digital connect card. Someone from our team will reach out to you this week. We're here to help you connect to a neighborhood church near you so that you can find community. So plan your visit for next Sunday. Have a great week, Family Church.